Well, pretty good. Okay. But it's a theory, and it's in chapter 16 that I'd never thought about. But you remember I told you that uh, over in chapter 16, uh, verse around verse 7, it says, When they come up to Myasia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. And that's always been a bit of a mystery. As why were they not allowed to go into Bithynia? And the guy I was reading had an interesting take on it. And he took the verse where, and you probably read it, where Paul says he had this thorn in his side. And a lot of people speculated, you know, what's that? Because he doesn't tell us what the thorn is. Most people think it may be some type of illness. The first time I heard it, after I'd had my first kidney stone, I knew exactly what it was. Uh, thorn inside, Paul's got kidney stones. Uh, but it could be a health issue because something happens that we, most people sort of dodge by. Uh, I didn't mention it because I didn't pick up on it, quite frankly. If you read that and you think, why were they not allowed to go to bed? And then you go on down, and the next place it talks the mass about the Macedonian call. And it says, and they went through the region of Phrygia, Galatia. Now, look at the pronouns. Verse 6 says, and they went through. Now, whoever's writing this, and we know who's writing it, by the way, says, talking about they. He's telling the story of someone else, Paul and Barnabas. They did this. Uh, well, actually, no, Barnabas, they split up Paul and Silas. Uh, and, but go on down, and it says, the, let's see where it should start. Yeah. Um, and a vision appeared to Paul, this is verse 9, and then I had a man in Macedonia was standing there urging him to say, come on over to Macedonia and help us. Verse 10, when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to Macedonia concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel. You see the change in pronouns? He's no longer talking about them. He's talking about us. So somebody has joined him here. And interestingly enough, we know who it is now because Luke wrote this. So Luke has joined him to get ready to go into Greece. Now, the significance there is Luke was a Greek. So we get the idea that Luke had either come over or he had been in the region uh, and was coming home. He, some people said Luke may have been a Jew. He may have been a convert and gone to Passover. We're not exactly sure. But at any rate, he was leaving. He was going back to his home, back to Greece. Now, what else do we know about Luke? Anything that you can think of? Physician. A doctor. So here's Paul, forbidden to go into Bithynia, hooks up with a doctor. That's where this guy gets the idea of maybe that pain in the side was an illness and Paul may have sought him out and saying, I've got a pain in the side. And in the process he said, well, I'll just go with you. You're going where I'm going because they had the Macedonian thing. And he said, this, I had a vision, a man from Macedonia, and maybe Luke said, well, I'll go with you and we'll check your health. It's all speculation, but it's good circumstantial evidence that maybe Luke joined them here because now he's talking about us and we and in the verse 11 he says so setting out sail from Troas we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and following David and Neopolis and there to Philippi leading city of the district we remained in this city some days and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gates of the riverside and that's where we sat down and spoke to the woman who was the seller of purple all that's we now here's another interesting little twist after he talks about how the Lord opened her heart and she paid attention to what Paul said, then verse 18 comes along. Y'all familiar with this story too. As we were going to the place of prayer, we, and I still Luke's with them, were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim <laughs> to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. Now, the interesting thing about this has always been, why did he do that? 
she was telling the truth, which leads us to another canon. <coughs> this woman is possessed by a spirit. It is a spirit of divination, which in the Old Testament, these people are cursed of God, not blessed of God. Uh, and she was a slave, and they were using her ability to foresee things. Basically, she was a medium, and they were using her ability as a medium to gain money. Now, uh, everybody know what a medium is? Okay. Uh, I used to watch them on TV. Remember those shows where the mediums yeah. come on? And they, they knew everything. And everybody said, how do they know this stuff? Well, I mean, my theory is that a medium knows because demons tell them. Because a medium doesn't deal with angels. They say they do. But they don't because God strictly forbids that in Scripture. But he talks about mediums and diviners and uh, you know, magicians and stuff. And he says it's all bad because if... If I want to know the future and God wants me to know the future, he will give me a prophetic word, sometimes called a word of knowledge. Uh, now, if you look, watch Pentecostals, they have a word of knowledge every time they turn around. But in the Bible, they're rather rare. But God wants us to know the things. He sends word to prophets. And sometimes the prophets don't even understand what they're saying because God is speaking through the Spirit to you and to your spirit and the spirit of others. It's not the same with diviners and with necromancers and these people. They are speaking very directly and they claim the power. Uh, remember the story of um, Nebuchadnezzar's dream where Daniel was called in. There's a couple of those stories, but one of them is specifically says that he had a dream. They called in all the wise men and astrologers and magi of the region and said, what's this dream about? Because this was their job. You know, they were reading the heavens and reading the bones and all the whatever they read. Uh, and nobody could explain it, which is rather odd because if they're following a medium procedure, they would have had a spirit speaking to them. So what's the answer? This dream was from God. It wasn't from Satan. The demons that they dealt with didn't understand it because it was from God. God gave a special vision that they couldn't interpret. But guess what? They brought in Daniel, and Daniel could interpret it. This got Daniel in trouble with all the, the medium people and the astrologer people and stuff like that. Uh, but it also shows that God is not giving them insight. He's giving it to his prophets, his called people. Uh, and so we have a situation here where this young girl, she's on the wrong side of spirit. She has a demonic spirit speaking to her. She is a medium to a demon. And these guys can say, well, this, this girl's going to make us some money. You know, we'll charge people for a reading or for, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's what they call it today. Uh, but she suddenly breaks into an ecstatic utterance. Now, why does she do that? We get a clue from Jesus. When Jesus encountered demons, what did they often do? Call his name. Yeah. They knew who he was. They recognized him. Uh, in one case, you know, that they asked him, they said, what have you got to do with us? It's not time. You know, I'm sure everybody's sitting around thinking, what? What are they talking about? <laughs> and then one of them called him the son of the most high God. I thought, well, that ought to be a tip off. People didn't quite understand how Jesus dealt with the demons. That's why the Pharisees at one point says he, he casts out demons by the power of Satan. He is, a, he is somebody that aligned with Beelzebub. And that's when Jesus turned and said, you know, if Satan cast out Satan, then his kingdom can't stand because he, he's divided against himself. And they said, well, that's true. This doesn't make any sense. How can this man be evil while he's doing nothing but good? This girl, a lot of people thought she's doing good. But there's the problem with mediumship. She knows, she tells, but as I've told you before, when you, when you deal with that side of spirituality, Satan will tell you the truth. That seems a little oxymoronic. The father of lies will tell you the truth because in order to make you believe him, you have to sort of salt the mind, they used to say. You have to give them some truth so that they will trust you. And once they trust you, 
You set them up for the big destruction. You tell them the lie that will lead to their destruction. This is how Satan works. Um, I, I used to do a Bible study on this with, with my students and the kids, and they really locked in on that because they said, that's exactly how my life goes. I think I'm doing something right, everything's working, and all of a sudden I believe something, it just comes crashing down. Usually a boyfriend or girlfriend left them. But uh, think about someone like us, and suddenly we base all our information on someone who says, well, I'm getting a, an angelic reading for you. And you, you start doing all this stuff. Debbie and I, we talked about investing and stuff. Uh, and I use that as an analogy. I used to use it as an analogy. I said, what if a guy gives you nine stock picks and you make a million dollars, then the spirit comes and says, invest it all in this one and you'll triple your money. And you do it and it goes bust. And suddenly you're the guy jumping out the window in the depression. Because that's what happened when people get so attached to their wealth and depression, they saw nothing with it, jumped out with us, they committed suicide. That's just what Satan wants. He wants to destroy you. And in order to destroy you, he will build you up with a false sense of security. Jesus doesn't do that. What's interesting is when you look at how Jesus deals with us, people say, well, I've got millions of dollars. Praise the Lord, he gave it to me. Well, he might, but you know, Jesus never talks about making people rich. He actually talks more about not making people rich because he said, where your wealth is, that's where your heart is. He says, you will be rich in the spirit. I always get a little dubious when I see some televangelist or somebody who's got like 10 homes or cars, what the was and stuff, talking about how God has blessed me. Look how God has blessed me. Well, you know what? God has blessed me, but I don't have a million dollars. Uh, I only got one car, and I'm quite happy with that. I wish my car was a little better shape, actually. But I've, I, then I've told you, and I've told you all, too. Whenever I get depressed, it's like the Lord comes to me and says, do you remember when I did this? And suddenly he's listing off all the things he's blessed me with, and I have to shake my head. I'm sorry, I got distracted by this sadness and I forgot that you have made me a really happy person. You know, people say, but you got cancer. Hey, cancer's worked out great for me. I can't use it anymore. I can't be he sees right through me. But yeah, you I know, say, I can't do anything, I got cancer. Yes, you can. Uh, but even having an illness, which I mean, technically I can say, I got a terminal illness, feel sorry for me, but it doesn't work because God has blessed me, and he is healing me. Now, will he heal me forever? Maybe not. I may die from it. But the blessing I've had through this is just so overwhelming because I have, we, we all have probably seen people with cancer, seen the suffering they've gone through. You know, folks, I haven't had that. I did the chemo thing. What hair's left is still there. Uh, I'm a little weaker, but so what? I can still get on my recliner, so I'm good. Uh, but God has blessed me. God blesses us in so many ways. That's why we need to focus upon Christ in our lives. And, well, the peace which passes understanding is the blessing that God gives you because you find joy, happiness and joy. Money can buy happiness. I won't lie. If I had tons of money, I could go buy something to be fun. I'd have me a toy. I'd probably go buy me a truck, and I'd have me a toy to play with, and I'd be happy with my toy. But it won't buy me joy because joy comes from within. Happiness comes from the out and then it goes back. But these people, they were happy because they had a slave who was making them some money. But this girl, you have to ask yourself, was she happy? She was a slave being drug around town, basically telling people what the demon told them to tell and making money for somebody else. And the odd thing is now that God crashes the party. Because these demons know who Paul is. There's a, there's a wonderful verse, I think it's over here in Acts, we'll come to it, where the seven guys go in to cast out a demon. Y'all remember that story? And the demon just beats them to pieces and throws them out in the street. And they're like, whoa, what happened? We were casting out demons in Jesus' name. And the demon speaks and says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but I don't know you guys. 
but they had they weren't in touch with God. They were just using God. And they know Paul. And so they said, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now that demon told the truth. And I have to ask myself, I wonder if that was the demon or if maybe it was something else speaking through this girl that maybe she was being prepared because look what happens. It goes on. Paul gets annoyed. I don't know why he's annoyed because what she's saying is true, but maybe the very fact that she's saying it uh, is going to get him in trouble because the Jews, when they hear stuff like that, they get mad at Paul. They're already getting mad at Paul. And he turns around and he said to the Spirit, not to the girl, but to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And it came over that very hour. Now, that's the good part of the story. And look how the people respond. Verse 8 to 19. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them to the market. Now notice the pronouns again. Why is Luke not in on this? Luke is telling the story, but now it's they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. Uh, and when they had brought them to the magistrate, they said, these men are Jews. Luke's not a Jew. They didn't arrest Luke. Luke is probably there, but he's Greek. And so Greeks aren't going to pick on Greeks. But the Jews is a different story. Plus, these guys may be Jews too, and they're not going to pick on a Greek. Why? Well, one thing is Greek. There's always the possibility, and they, it happens here, that this Greek could be a Roman, because guess what? They're in a Roman colony territory. Uh, Philippi was a Roman colony made up mostly of Roman soldiers who mustered out in that region. So you grab a guy who speaks Latin and Greek because he's a doctor, he could be a Roman. So they didn't mess with Luke. Now that's a bit of speculation it doesn't say, but Luke doesn't say. He just says, they got in trouble. These men are Jews disturbing the city. Well, they didn't disturb the city, they disturbed these guys. They advocate customs that are not law for us as Romans to accept. Whoa, wait a minute. Now these guys are saying they're Romans. Now whether they are not seems a little odd because if they were Romans, there would be no case here because Romans could do whatever they want. According to the law of Pax Romana, which is the peace of Rome, a Roman could get away with murder if he could justify it. Now the interesting thing about the law is if he can't justify it, then he gets punished. But if a Roman like in this case, accuse somebody, they are disturbing the peace and killed them, they would be justified in doing that because they're Romans. You don't mess with Romans. And that's where it gets a little weird here because they've grabbed two guys, and guess what? Paul and Silas are Roman citizens. Paul, born a Roman citizen. Silas may have purchased it. We're not sure. But he was... He may have been born a Roman too. It doesn't ever say for sure. But anyway, the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they drew them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet to the stocks. Now what happened there is a mob takes over. They do the beating. It's not a typical Roman beating with a lictor. It's a rod beating, which if you've ever been beat with a rod, that's not fun either. Uh, but then it's getting out of hand, so the guy says, get them in prison and make sure they're safe. In other words, we don't want to kill these guys. It's interesting, through studying this, we get a glimpse into what's going on. Rome was brutal, and Rome would kill people left and right. But Rome had like two faces. Uh, one face was just evil. The other face was more benevolent because... They didn't want to kill everybody because people pay taxes. And Rome was about making the money. Uh, I've told you about Pilate. Pilate went into Jerusalem. First thing he did was crucify 100 people. He thought he was showing them who was boss. Well, the priest showed him who was boss. They sent a letter to Caesar. And Caesar sent a letter back to Pilate saying, why are you killing my taxpayers? Because Palestine was a Caesarean province. Every dime of taxes went straight to Caesar. And he said, don't be killing my taxpayers. And suddenly Pilate, who was a friend, not of Caesar, but of Janus, 
uh, suddenly he's thinking, whoa, I better back off the killing. So it's like ixnay on the crucifixion, I beat them and send them on. Uh, but we get this, we an understanding of the culture. And so here, they're, they're not killing these guys, uh, even though they're, they think they're Jews, which they are, but they're also Romans. About midnight, and here's the miracle, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was an earthquake. Here comes a supernatural, natural phenomenon. I say supernatural, natural, because it is a natural phenomenon that you have an earthquake, but the <coughs> timing is what's important. Think about this, because there's always this big argument about the miracles of the Bible are not miracles, they just happen. Red Sea, wow, that thing divides all the time. They have real problems. And actually it does from time to time, but not where we think. The Red Sea uh, has been known to separate over in the Gulf of Aqaba, where I told you that's where probably it really happened, because of strong winds. And the Bible says that's exactly what happened. An east wind blew all night and pushed the waters back. So is that a miracle, or is that just a natural occurrence? People say, just a natural occurrence. You've got to take the timing into consideration, because Moses showed up, and the Red Sea parted. God had a plan. Now, is it a, does it take away from the miracle when God uses the very nature he created? Think about that. There's a lot of theories about the ten plagues of Egypt. What I find very interesting is it is believed that these plagues happened at a time when something else happened, and it was the eruption of Santorini. Y'all know about that? The island of Santorini in the Aegean Sea, just north of Egypt. That island had a volcano right in the middle, and it blew to the sky high. Today, Santorini is a big tourist destination. It's got, it's the place that you'll see all these pictures of Greece, and you see these white buildings with blue roofs. That's Santorini. You take a cruise ship in there because within inside the crater of the old volcano is the sea has come in, and you have a ring of islands, uh, and you climb up to the top and you know you visit beautiful Santorini. Everybody goes gets their picture made sitting on the white walls and stuff. I'd be a little scared myself for that thing. What if that thing blows again? Uh, but anyway, Santorini exploded about this same time, and guess what? It threw all kinds of stuff south toward Egypt it could be responsible for flaming hail because what landed was actually magma, rocks. And when they hit the ground, they burst into fire. Now, if you don't know about Santorini exploding, you might be an Egyptian sitting there and saying, oh, hell's coming down, whoa, it burns. It's like, that would make sense. It could also uh, start at what's known as the iron ore rush from flooding in the Nile. And up the Nile, there is iron deposits which turn it red and we killed all the fish. You kill all the fish, you got uh, flies and stuff coming out and eating the carcasses. It, it makes sense. And by saying it though, I know I've said this one time with some preachers and they said, man, that's blasphemy. I said, it's not blasphemy. God uses what God wants. He made it, he can do what he wants with it. I'm just saying that there may be a natural explanation for the events. What's supernatural is the timing because Santorini exploded not based on chance. Moses is sitting there and say, God has demanded, let my people go. And he has plagues. Well, did Santorini hear Moses say, oh, time for us to blow up? No, Santorini is just a volcano. But God was in control. We see this when we do little things. Here we have another natural event, but it happens right when it needs to happen. But some things happen with it. The great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Now, something a little strange about that. I could see it shaking the doors open, but how did they unlock their chains? You know, that's pretty supernatural. Uh, the next thing seemed it sort of supernatural in a way, because when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open and drew his sword and was about to kill himself, because he was in charge. It's another thing Rome does. If you're a Roman soldier or someone serving and you don't do your job, they'll kill you. Remember I told you about decimation? When Rome went to war, if they lost a battle, and I, it doesn't make sense to me, but it worked, they would take 
the legion or the group that fought the, the worst, and they'd pull them out, and they'd line them up and walk down the row, and every tenth man, des means ten, decimation, every tenth man was put to the sword. Now, they called that not decimation, but motivation. Because if you're a Roman soldier, and you see the guy beside you get killed because he didn't fight tough enough, and they say, what are you going to do tomorrow? I'm going to fight like you never saw. <laughs> yeah, just watch me. Number seven. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be either 9 or 11. <laughs> but that's what this guy was thinking. He said, I might as well kill myself because tomorrow they're coming here. This prison's empty. I'm a dead man. And he's getting ready to commit suicide, fall on his sword. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, says, don't harm yourself, for we're all here. Now, that's what I think is sort of amazing. I understand Paul and Silas staying because they're, they're good people. But why did the other prisoners stay? You know, why didn't they just go running out of that place? And you have to think, maybe they had a little revival service. Because Paul and Silas sitting here praying and singing hymns to God. And what did happen? And the prisoners were listening. Now, they may have just been hard up for entertainment. But suddenly they're stopping to listen to this. They've heard about these guys. they probably heard about the, the girl. And it's like something happened to them. They could have been out of prison. Nobody would have known until they came, and nobody came. So they could have run and scattered all up. But instead, they stayed. And Paul says, we're all here. And this guy called for lights. He rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The thing I notice here is he brings them out, but he doesn't bring the other prisoners out. They stay in jail and he locks the door. And I thought, well, that's sort of too bad for them. But not if they had their life truly changed. Because think about this for a second. You cannot put a Christian in prison. I know that don't make sense, does it? But what I'm talking about is you can lock their bodies in a cell, but their spirit is always free. You know, you can... You can put them in a hole in the ground and cover it over, but they're still a child of God and they're still free. Paul says it when he's about to die. We don't know exactly when he died, but before he died, he said, I'm ready. You know, I poured my life out like a drink offering, but for me to live is gain, but to die is Christ. So this is going to be better for me. That's the attitude that Paul takes about death, and that's the attitude we should have. It's interesting that all the disciples, we believe, were martyred. The Catholic Church says they were and gives stories. Some of them you can't really believe because they're not historically proven. But the ones we know, such as James, Stephen, Paul, Peter, we know they died. We know how they died. And they all died courageously as martyrs. Uh, Peter, remember his story? They were going to crucify him. He says, I don't, I'm not worthy. I have to be crucified. And the Romans, in their just jokingly way, said, okay, turn him upside down. And they crucified him upside down. You know what's horrible about that, by the way? Some people might not realize it. You don't die as fast when you're upside down. You die longer. Because when you're right side up, they, they put you up in such a way that the only way you survive is by lifting yourself up to take a breath. Because crucifixion, believe it or not, is death by suffocation, not by torture. When you're hung on a cross, you have to push your body up to take a breath, and then you sink down, and these muscles cut off your breathing supply, and you die of suffocation. Uh, that's why they nail your feet. That makes it even more painful, because to, to, to push yourself up, you have to push against the nail in your feet. So imagine having a nail in your foot, pushing your full weight on it just so you can take a breath and then drop back down. And then you pull on your hands, and they've got ropes there to keep you from jerking the nail clean out of your hand. It is not a happy moment. Uh, but Peter's upside down, so all the blood's rushing to his brain, and they're just laughing because he's going to hang that way for quite a while. I don't exactly know how long it, you know how long it takes somebody to die with blood rushing to their head, but it, he could possibly have been there for days uh, because crucifixion, the early crucifixion, the Egyptian version, they strapped them up where they could breathe and they just left them exposed to the sun. And it took a week sometimes for them to die because they're just hanging there in the sun. You think about Egypt and the heat there. But the Romans took that way and it improved on it to make it more brutal. So 
Um, he's saying, what must I do to be saved? The question I've always had is, why is he talking about salvation? The only mention of salvation was up here with that comedian. She said, uh, service of the Most High God, who proclaim you the way of salvation. It must have been that that story got around so much and what she said and what happened that down here he's thinking these people proclaim the way of salvation. So what am I going to ask him? I'm going to ask him, how can I be saved? You, you're here for salvation and you obviously have power. I mean, earthquake, chains falling off, you have power. And he says, what do I have to do to be saved? And they said, and I love this, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, that doesn't mean that they're, you know, once, once Bob believes, Gene's saved. It just means that once Bob believes, Gene's going to have the same opportunity. Everybody in the house will have that opportunity. And they do, by the way. But the thing I like is believe in the Lord Jesus. And I have to be careful, I'll preach a sermon on this, but you've heard this sermon over and over from me. The key to salvation is belief. It's not about fact. And I, I say that as often as I can because I believe that Jesus was a real person, that he died on the cross, he rose from that. I believe that. Can I prove any of it? No. Because I don't have a body. I don't have a real location. We went to two. You know, and we were in Jerusalem. I went to one. You guys went to. Uh, the thing about it is, and I think it's purposeful that God has given us his story and and give us this witness and it's based on faith if it were all fact and we could go and point to the exact place and see the body of Christ and all this stuff either people would believe or they would stop believing because the resurrection is one of the main key points to being a Christian no resurrection a lot of people think he was a great guy but a lot of great guys get worshipped Muhammad was a great guy according to the Muslims Buddha was a great guy. All these people died and were buried. We even know where Abraham's buried. We don't know where Jesus is buried because he came out of the grave. That's what makes it unique. Uh, there are people who claim it, but who still have their bodies. Uh, you can go to Tehran and visit the grave of Valhalla the, for the Baha'is. You know, they know where their, their leaders died, they know where they're buried. Jesus died, was buried, and then rose again. We don't have a body. So it comes down to faith. And I, and I go back to that thing. I remember I told about me and Raleigh Chambers at the FCA camp arguing over what's more important, love or faith. And I said, Raleigh, you got to have faith so that you can love. He said, no, you have to love and you don't have faith. And we went back and forth all week. Well, I was right, of course, but he still believes it. I saw him not long ago. He hadn't changed a bit. But I think it's about belief. And I love it because Jesus says the same thing. Remember all those times when Jesus was talking to somebody and he looks at him and he says, just believe. Just believe. If, you know, a lot of people, I, I think, probably would have said, well, what's belief going to do? Look at the situation I'm in. Jesus said, just believe. And what he's saying is, have faith. Remember he healed the, the guy at the pool? What did he tell him? He says, your faith has healed you. Now, that doesn't take the power away from God at all. Some people say, well, if it's faith is all you need, then what do we need Jesus for? Jesus is the source of what we believe in. Our faith in him. Not our faith in ourselves, but our faith in him. But don't ever get caught into the argument of finding facts. That's what apologists do. And in my early days, I considered myself an apologist because I was looking like so many other students I was looking for all the facts so that I could lay them out on the table and say, look, fact, 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 fact. I can prove everything in the Bible to be true. And then one day it hit me. I thought, Jesus didn't call me to prove him. He called me to accept him. And that's the big miracle. That I live my life based on faith, not on fact. Scientists, it drives me crazy. Not anymore, but the scientists are crazy. I can tell what a woman is based on faith. They seem to not be able to. But we live in this stage of science and culture, and science loses to culture because people 
are starting, and I know this is going to sound really weird to put it this way, people are starting to live on, but live by faith, by their belief. This whole issue we have today on transgender and on LGBT, you know, that's a faith issue. Because, when, well, when I came in, when I come in here someday and I'm sitting here dressed as a woman, say, I identify as a woman. After you finish laughing, you'll think, Brooks, are you crazy? I say, no, I believe I'm a woman. Well, you don't believe it because facts are right before you. I'm the ugliest one in the world. But these people are using the perversion of faith. Now, think about that, too. We live in a world where Satan seeks to pervert everything of God. Look at the history of it. In the Middle Ages, the first thing, when the Bible became available to people, you know what the second book that became available to them? It was the Satanic Bible, written backwards. The sacred mass of the church, what became available after that? The satanic mass, which is a backwards mass. Satanism started, and it, and it was quickly called witchcraft, and they started burning witches, but Satanism started and sort of went away, but it came back uh, in the 60s with Anton LaVey. But it's always been around, and it's always the opposite of whatever the church does, they do. Uh, that's how Satan works. Jesus is truth personified. Satan, father of all lies. And he lies about everything. He tells you enough truth so he can get you to the lie. But remember, his goal is not to be the truth sayer, but to get you to the lie. And once you have enough confidence that Satan is your friend, then he will destroy you. You don't want a friend like that. Christ is a friend who doesn't water things down. Jesus said, they're going to hate you. They're going to chase you. They're going to kill you. Now, how many people would want to join that club? And yet we do. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. He said, oh, by the way, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you will be also. That's a great promise. How do we know it's true? We don't. We accept it on faith. Everything we do on faith. This man is putting all his faith in the words of Paul and Silas that Jesus will prepare a place for him too. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, all who were in his house. He took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds. He was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into the house, set food before them, rejoiced along with his entire household that he, knew, that he had believed in God. Now, think about this. We've got a demon-possessed girl and a Roman jailer in this. They're saved. Two great victories. Did she come out of being uh, a slave? No. Did he stop being a Roman jailer? Probably not. That's his job. Their lives were changed on the inside. The outside, not so much. Sometimes our outside life doesn't change, but it's our inside life because we, we join ourselves with God in the struggle to believe. Every day, we have to struggle. Don't ever think that because you're a Christian, number one, you're smarter than everybody else, you know more than everybody else, or number two, that you don't have any struggles because usually when you become a Christian, the struggle of life begins in earnest. And somebody, who was it? It might have been uh, Billy Graham's kid. I forgot his name. Frank. Frank. Franklin, thank you. I think it was him uh, this week he was talking about this American person the work they're doing in Ukraine. And somehow he said, if Satan's not attacking you, he's not worried about you. You're not doing anything. He said, but we have come under attack, not physically by bombs and stuff, but by people trying to block us from doing good deeds in Ukraine, if you can believe that. But that's one of the things that Satan does. I believe Satan's behind all war, and he wants people to die. Notice this war, uh, they're just bombing and killing civilians. I don't think that's a military tactic. They say it is. But Satan is trying to go against those people, prevent them. Got a couple minutes. Uh, so now we have the next twist in the story. Verse 35. But when it was day, 
the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates just said, let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. Oh, wait a second. Where are they? It's daytime. They've been at his house all night eating, being patched up. Things were great. But now the jailer says, come out now and go in peace. Now, he could be talking about his house, or he may have put him back in jail. Because, remember, it's still his job. They're still prisoners. And I would think Paul and Silas would have said, lock us back up. We don't want you to get in trouble. They're looking out for him. I would think that very possible. But Paul said to, to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens. And that moment was the, that moment you get when you eat too much ice cream, you get a brain freeze. It's like, oh my gosh, you're Romans? They have thrown us into prison. So they're in prison, I think. I think he put them back. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came, and they apologized. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Now, a couple of things here, what Paul does. He's nice in the end, but he, he shakes them up, and he knows he's going to shake them up. I mean, he's been beat with rods, he's been mobbed, he's been thrown into jail, uh, been through an earthquake. But it all led to the conversion of the jailer and his whole family. How many of you would trade all that negative for that one positive? I mean, is there some, uh, they didn't know this guy, but imagine somebody you know that you've been praying for a long time and you had to suffer so they'd be saved. You'd do it in a heartbeat. If it's one of your kids, you'd do anything. You'd suffer anything to make sure they were saved. I think Paul and Silas had an attitude of looking at people and thinking, we want to bring God to these people and whatever it takes. Here's a situation where Paul knows the law. He's smart. And you'll see how smart he is in chapter 17. But um, he tells that jailer, he says, well, got a little problem. You beat us out in public, which they did after Roman. We were beaten without being condemned. In other words, there was no indictment. The men and women who are Romans, and then you threw us in prison. I, I'm sorry I get distracted, but the first thing popped into mind, are you aware of the January 6th people? You know how many are in jail right now? From January the 6th. I mean, I want to think it's up to 1,500 that were put in jail last year. Some of them have been in jail for over a year now. How many have been indicted? About two, or two or three. Less than that, about two or three. And they got, we're innocent by the way. They are indicted. But there have been no mass trials. And the ones that are in jail are in solitary confinement. And most of them have not even been indicted. In other words, they haven't been charged with anything. The, if you listen to the news, you listen to the politicians, they say, we've got these insurrections locked up. But if you listen to the Justice Department, who's in charge of all this, nobody has been called insurrectionist. Nobody has been charged with insurrection. So why do they use that word? Nobody's in charge with anything except for theft, because somebody stole something in one of the offices. Uh, but it was a misdemeanor. The sad thing is that some of the people that have been charged that were not locked up, two of them have committed suicide. I'm sure you've heard about that. But one guy was charged with being an insurrectionist and the word got out to his hometown. They made his life so hard that he hung himself in his garage. His mother said, my son has never done anything to anybody. She said on that day he went there and a policeman ushered him in to the Capitol and took him in the lower floor, talked to him. He said he walked through, walked out, came home. Next thing he knew, he was being charged and sought. And they were calling him an insurrectionist. 
the people in town, it must have been a liberal town, they started calling, he was getting called and I giving him a hard time. He felt responsible for some of the stuff that happened. His, and he felt guilty and his mother said he didn't do anything, but they made him feel responsible. And finally he couldn't take it and he killed himself. You know, to me, that's, that's murder by the government. They didn't need to do that. They don't need to keep those guys in prison. Do you know that the people that are arrested for gun violence in New York get out of jail in probably 24 hours? No bail. And yet these guys who did nothing more than walk into the building. Now there's a handful of them, the uh, Proud Boys. You know, you look at the videos, the Proud Boys, and they're in uniform. They're the ones doing most of the violence. And there wasn't but a dozen or so there. Uh, but more and more videos are coming out now of the police ushering people into the Capitol, laughing, talking with them, smiling, well, taking them through the Hall of Statues. And they're not doing a thing except taking pictures. And if you look for it, you'll find it. And yet people are using this political politicalization. Uh, and mainly it's to get Trump in trouble. But, you know, the whole thing is so unjust. And that's what Paul's pointing out. He said, we haven't been condemned, but we've been punished. And by the way, we're, we have rights over and above a lot of you people's rights, the rights of a Roman citizen. And if you take a Roman citizen and beat them, you can be put to death. That's why they're afraid. You know, if that had been anybody else, they'd have said, well, I'll just send them on their way. But a Roman citizen, that sends a chill. I think I've told you this, but the Roman Pax Romana, the law was that if a crime occurs in the city that the crime occurred in, the people don't tell them who it was or turn them over, the entire city can be killed. That happened in small villages. If somebody, particularly on a Roman road, if somebody robs somebody on a Roman road, you go to that place, you go to the town, they say, turn over the robber. And they said, we don't know who it is. They kill the whole town. Like I said, they call it motivation. And by the way, it was. The, the Pax Romano was one of the most peaceful times in history because people were scared to death of Rome. Now, no, I ain't got any more time. Well, that's good. I'll start chapter 17 next week. Uh, we got Easter, but I do want to share some stuff with you because Paul and Silas continue with Luke. He sort of rejoins them. They, he still talks in third person, but later he's going to get back to speaking in uh, first person as he's sort of narrating what he's writing uh, but I'll, I'll share that with you let's have a word for him don't hear this cantata Heavenly Father we thank you for this day the beauty of this day is just beyond belief when we look out at the blue sky and it's a little chilly but it's so beautiful and flowers are blooming we give you thanks for just sort of wowing us with your creation and we thank you God that we can come together that we can share in a time of studying your word and, and looking Lord at the history that is ours and the faith history that is ours. Lord, we pray not only for those we've mentioned our prayer request, but for those that we haven't mentioned. But we also pray, Lord, sometimes for ourselves that you will give us the strength and the faith to serve you and to represent you as best we can in every situation, that we can reach out to others and lead them to salvation. Forgive us for our weaknesses, strengthen us, God, for your service, and make us the people you can have us to be. In Christ's name I pray. Anybody on there? Uh, well, I'm heartbroken. I don't see any names. Mm, that's a lot.